This lecture is for chapter six, and it's all about probability. And essentially, we're going to be using the z-scores that you learned how to calculate in the last lecture to find the probability of outcomes when we don't have access to the raw data. We're also going to be using z-scores to find specific values associated with specific probabilities, again, when we don't have access to the real data. But we'll start with situations where we do have access to the real data, and then we'll move into using something called the unit normal table, which is what is necessary to have to find probabilities and scores associated with probabilities when we don't have access to the real data. So that being said, make sure that you have your unit normal table ready before we get to that point so that you can follow through with me when I go through and look for the values in the table. And as you can see on the slide, you can get a copy of all the tables we'll be using in this class from the modules tab on Canvas, or you can find it in the back of your book. If you have the new edition, it starts on page 571. If you have the old edition, it starts on page 584. So the topics that will be covered in this lecture are how to determine probability using frequency distribution tables. This should all be review from chapter two, but we'll cover it anyways. Then probability and random samples in inferential statistics. So what is a truly random sample and how does that have an impact on the probability of different types of samples? And probability in the normal distribution. So remember in the last lecture, I said that we're only gonna focus on the normal distribution from here on out. And that's because the qualities of the unit normal table that I mentioned earlier are only upheld when we have a normal distribution. So that table isn't useful, the unit normal table isn't useful when we don't have a normal distribution. Hence the word normal in the name of the table. Then we'll do some calculations of finding probabilities associated with specific x values, and then finding x values associated with specific probabilities. And all of those calculations will be using z-scores and the unit normal table. So, Basic probability is just the likelihood of a specific outcome given all possible outcomes. And probability really starts as a fraction, so the number of the specific outcome divided by the number of all possible outcomes. And then you, turn, you do the division here, it turns into a decimal. So in decimal form, that would be the probability of something. But most people find it easier to interpret probability in terms of percentages. So you can turn your P, your probability, into a percentage or a percent chance just by simply multiplying it by 100. So here's an example that should look familiar to you from chapter two when we look at the frequency distribution table, the full version of it with everything included. So here we've got how many pizza slices have you consumed in the past month? And let's say that we asked every single person in a specific class how many pizza slices that they've consumed. So I'm going to be calling these people a population. They're everybody I'm interested in. Maybe, you know, everybody in Psych 210. And two people have said that they had six pizza slices in the past month. Two people have had five. Two people have had four slices. Seven people had 30 slices and all the way down, same trend. So you can easily calculate the probability or proportion. These two words are synonymous with each other. You can say the proportion in terms of, you know, what portion of this population has each specific value or probability in terms of what's the probability of randomly selecting a student from this population with the specific value. The number that you get is the same, it's just the interpretation that's a little bit different. So just looking at this, what proportion of students in my population have consumed six pizza slices in the past month? Well, you just take two, remember, the number of the specific outcome, six is our specific outcome, there's two students with that specific outcome, divided by the total number of all possible outcomes, which in this case would be 46. So two out of 46 consumed six pizza slices in the past month. Two divided by 46 is 0 0.043. So you could say that 
0.043 is the proportion of students in this population who've consumed six pizza slices in the past month. Well, you could rephrase this and say the probability of randomly selecting a student from this sample or this population who consumed six pizza slices is 0.043. And I'll talk about random sampling here in a little bit, but for now, just realize that random sampling means that everybody in the population or the sample that the selection is being taken from has an equal chance of being selected. So it's not based on anything, it's just randomly choosing people from this population. So let's jump to another one. So let's say, all right, calculating this proportion or probability. Well, looking at two pizza slices, 20 students, 20 out of 46, 20 being the specific outcome, 46 being all possible outcomes, 20 divided by 46, 20 divided by 46 gives you 0.435. Remember, I said the probability or the proportion is in decimal form. So if you're asked for a probability, you want to leave it in decimal form. Now, one way when you're creating these columns to make sure that you've done, or these rows, to make sure that you've done everything correctly, is you add up all of the probabilities for all of the values in your data set, and you should get a value that's within rounding error of 1. So the value for a proportion or a probability can never exceed 1 because 1 represents all of the possible outcomes. Conversely, if you turn this into a percent, so P times 100, 1 times 100, 100%, it's impossible to have greater than a 100% chance of any given outcome because it's impossible to have more than an absolute certainty of getting any possible outcome, 100% chance. Just like it's also impossible to have less than zero for a probability. You'll never have a negative probability value, just like it's less, it's never possible to have a less than 0% chance of something. If it's a 0% chance of something, it's not going to happen. It can't be any less possible than that. So it's impossible to have less than a 0% chance. It's also impossible to have less than a zero probability or a negative probability. Just wanted to point that out. Then percent chance, just like you see here, P times 100, you simply multiply all these probabilities by 100 and you get 4.3 percent. So you could do this by taking, okay, 2 out of 46 then multiplying that way by 100 or you can just use the number that you got over here, 0 0.043, multiply that by 100, you get 4.3% chance. Just like adding all the probabilities up should give you 1 or close to it, adding all the percent chances up should give you 100 or close to 100. Again, this should all be reviewed from Chapter 2. Then the cumulative percent, or the percentile, those two words mean the same thing. Basically, what percentage of people in our population or sample have a score that's equal to or less than a specific value. So just as a review, you get your cumulative percent or your percentile by starting with the percentage of scores for the lowest score in your data set, so 2.2%. Then you add that to the next highest or the, the next percent for the next highest value. Then you take that final value and add that to the percentage of scores with the next highest response. So this plus this, and then you do that all the way up to the top. Because if you think about it, if we, we start here because there's no way that there's no scores less than zero in this data set. So what percentage of scores are equal to or less than the lowest value? Well, the percentage of scores that are the lowest value, there's nothing less than that. And then you're just gradually working your way up. So if I said, you know, if I looked at this and I said, okay, four pizza slices. Well, 91.3% of this population has consumed four or less pizza slices. Another way to check your work here, when you get to the highest value in your data set, the cumulative percent or the percentile for that should be the same value that you got when you added all the percentages together in this column here. They should be the same close to 100. So you can answer some questions pretty easily from your 
from your table that you wouldn't necessarily be able to answer if your data was in raw form. So what's the probability of randomly selecting a person with x equals 4 slices? Well, that would be 0.043 right here. So you could find that really easily in this table. What's the probability of randomly selecting a person who consumed less than or equal to three pizzas? Well, there's multiple ways that you can find this. This is really asking for the percentile of someone who ate three pizzas or the cumulative percent for three pizzas. Because remember, cumulative percent or percentile tells you the percentage that's less than or equal to a specific value. So you could go straight to that column and see 87 for three pizzas. Or you could add 7 plus 20 plus 12 plus 1, the specific outcome we're interested in, and divide it by 46, and you'll get 0 0.870. You could also add all these probabilities and get that same value. What's the probability of randomly selecting a person who consumed more than three pizzas? Well, that's no longer looking for the cumulative percent. So we can say, all right, more than three, that's four, five, or six pizza slices. Well, two plus two plus two is six divided by 46. Or you could just add these three together and come up with 0.129. Then the last one, what is the probability of randomly selecting a person be with between two and four pizzas or pizza slices? Between two and four, that's looking at these values here, so these people. So you could add 2 plus 7 plus 20 divided by 46, or you could add these three together and you come up with 0 0.630. So this is the process that you use to find probabilities or proportions when you have access to the raw data. But as we'll see here in a little bit, sometimes you don't have access to the raw data and you still need to figure these sorts of things out so you can calculate z-scores, use the unit normal table to find these answers when you don't have access to the raw data. So remember that inferential statistics are all about using limited information from the population, a sample, right, taking some people from the population, but not everybody, to answer questions about the population. So we're taking a sample, whoever we have access to, hopefully it's a random sample, to answer questions about the population because typically we either don't have access to everyone in the population or we don't have the resources to study everyone in the population. So probabilities are one major connection between samples and populations as long as the composition of the sample is representative of the population. So for the sample to be an accurate representation of the population from which it's drawn, two conditions should be met to have a truly random sample, and that are these random and replacement. So random sampling simply relies on chance, not purposeful selection of members from the population. So let's say um, your sample would be biased or not representative of the population if it wasn't random, if it was based on some systematic sampling or if it was based on convenience or whoever you had access to. So if your sample is biased or not representative of the population, then your inferences can be faulty. So for example, let's say that there was a Gallup poll on President Obama's approval rating. Well, that wouldn't be very accurate if they only asked Republicans or only asked Democrats. So think about it, that's not a representative sample if they only ask Democrats how do you feel about President Obama? Well, chances are that would overestimate the favorability of the president in the population at large, who includes Democrats and Republicans and independents and all sorts of political affiliations. So a random sample would be taking a sample from all different political affiliations. It's not selected based on that. Then the second condition for a true random sample is replacement. So sampling with replacement requires that the probability of obtaining any given selection remains consistent across multiple selections. So in order to do this, you replace the first selection before making the next selection. So technically, you could make the same selection twice. So just as a practical example, let's say that I was taking a sample from this population of students. 
And let's say that I, the first person I randomly selected was somebody with three pizza slices. Well, before I make my next selection, I'm going to put them back in so that I'm still drawing from the same 46 people that I was for the first selection. So it wouldn't be a truly random sample if I drew the person who had three slices and then left them out before making my next selection because the probability wouldn't be consistent across every selection because now we would only be drawing from 45 people. So that's replacement. Whenever a selection is made, it's put back into the pool of selections before the next selection is made. And we'll get into this more when we talk about the sampling distribution. So again, inferential statistics are all about using limited information from the population to answer questions about the population, or in other words, using samples to make inferences about the population. And the tools and analysis that we use are most accurate with random sampling, so everyone has an equal chance of being selected across all selections. Probability is probably the most important tool for linking samples to populations because of this process right here. So we start off with random sampling. And with random sampling, we're pretty confident that this sample represents the population. So let's just say, for example, that I am um, an HR manager at the Netflix call center. And I'm getting ready to test a new training program that's aimed at decreasing call times. So we want to have those call times be a lot faster. So before I implement this training company-wide, I just take a random sample of people from the call center. I don't select from any specific shift or from any specific group because by doing so, I may have people in my sample that don't represent the population. Maybe if I only se select from the morning shift, the characteristics of their job differ from the characteristics of the job or the characteristics of the people doing the job for the rest of the shifts in the company. So take a random selection from everybody in the company and make it a pretty large random selection, but not too large so that it's too costly to test this training. And then I think, okay, I'm pretty confident that my sample represents the population. Then I give them the training. So in this case, the training would be the independent variable and the dependent variable that I'm going to measure would be their call times. So manipulate the condition, the training, give this representative random sample the training, then I can measure their call times after the training, measure that dependent variable, those call times. So now we get to the probability part of this. So if this sample no longer represents the population, or in other words, if their call times are a lot lower, hopefully the training had the desired effect, their call times are a lot lower than the call times in the population who didn't receive the training, then when we calculate a z-score for them, it's going to be extremely low. And what, what you'll see once we look at the unit normal table, whenever you have extreme z-scores or larger z-scores, you'll see that there's a low probability that you would get that z-score from this population. And so you can say, well, these people in the sample no longer represent that population. It's highly unlikely that we would see call times that are this short if these people still represented the population. So conversely, you could say, well, they don't represent the population anymore because this training changed them in some way. Now they're actually doing better than the population at large. They're better at their job. They have less call times, shorter call times. So then, regardless of what you get, if you get extreme scores or not, this results in a better understanding of nature. And this process is similar to the flowchart that I showed you in the first lecture when we talked about the scientific method. But now we're applying z-scores to this. So again, if the sample, you know, you, you take a random sample, they represent the population, you change something about the sample, and then you're hoping that they no longer represent the population, meaning that it's highly unlikely that you would randomly select people with these characteristics, in this example, call times, from this popu original population that didn't receive the training. So, let's go ahead and look at some calculating some probabilities 
with random sampling. So pretending that we have a truly random sample. So let's go ahead and I actually looked at the course makeup for Psych 210. And we have, let's say, 11 males and 27 females in the class. So what's the probability of randomly selecting a male or female from the population of all of the students? And remember, a random selection. So I'm not just selecting the people that sit in the front or the back or anything like that. It's completely random. So with a truly random sample, we would have for the probability of selecting a male. So let's put probability of a male. Well, the number of males is 11, and the total number of students is 38. So 11 divided by 38 is 0.289. So that would be the probability of randomly selecting a male from the class. And if we multiply this by 100, we could say 28.9% chance. Now I divided by 38 because I care about the entire class. And if there's 11 males and 27 females, then there's a total of 38 students in the class. So that's the total number of all outcomes. Now, probability of selecting a female. Well, there's 27 females divided by 38 students total, and we end up with 0.711. Multiply that by 100, and you would see a 71.1% chance of randomly selecting a female from the class. So another way that you can think about this, remember, proportion and probability have the same values. We could say that 28.9% of the class are males, or you have a 28.9% chance of randomly selecting a male from the class. Then with females, we could say there's 71.1% of the class are females, or there's a 71.1% chance of randomly selecting a female from the class. Now, just like before, when you add the probability or proportion for all the outcomes, you end up with 1. The same thing goes here. 0 0.289 plus 0 0.711 would give you 1. 28.9% chance plus a 71.1% chance would give you a 100% chance of randomly selecting a male or a female from the class. That's our only options. Either We either have males or females in the class. So how likely is it that we would select a male or a female? Well, it's a certainty that we would select a male or female. There's a 100% chance. Now this next one helps you understand the characteristics of a truly random sample, random with replacement. So a random sample of three students is selected from the class. If the first two students in the sample are female, then what is the probability that the third student will also be female? Remember, truly random sample, and for our purposes in this class, anytime you see the word random sample, that means that it meets both these two criteria, random with replacement. So it doesn't matter what was selected first. It's not going to change the probability of this third selection. So you're not going to have to take into account if it's a truly random sample. Oh, okay, well the first two students in the sample were female, so now we only have 25 females and we only have 36 total people in the population that we're selecting from, you would just completely disregard the first two selections because those two females were put back into the pool of people that we're selecting from before the next selection would be made. So, if we look at this, it would still be 0.711 it's a truly random sample. So the fact that we had two females selected already isn't going to have an impact because they're still in the pool for this third selection. Okay. So remember before I mentioned that we are only going to be working with normal distributions and it's 
not a bad thing because for the most part, most variables in nature are normally distributed. So intelligence is an example. Most people, you know, fall in the middle and then we've got extremely intelligent and extremely not so intelligent. Height and weight is another example. Reaction times, job satisfaction, personality traits. You know, some people are extreme on one end or the other. Most people fall in between and so on and so forth. And once we get to samples, you'll see that the distribution of sample means, which we aren't there yet, but that's almost always normal as well. So just kind of a review of the normal distribution. So in the normal distribution, it's symmetrical and unimodal. The mean equals the median. So remember, the median's the midpoint. There's 50% of scores above, 50% below. The mean is in the middle, and that equals the median. The mean also equals the mode. So the most frequent score is also the mean. And then there's extreme scores on the higher or the low end, so rare scores falling on either end of the distribution. So once you get out further into these tails, you're in the, remember this is the frequency, higher frequency, lower frequency, get out into the tail end of these distributions, more extreme or less frequent scores. So one of the really good things about the normal distribution is that it has these predictable proportions or probabilities based on the mean and the standard deviation. And I talked about this a little bit in the chapter four lecture, I believe. All right, so 68% of scores, or P equals 0.68, fall within one standard deviation of the mean, be it above or below the mean. So within a z-score of from negative one to positive one. So remember, the z-score just tells you how many standard deviations away whatever the score is from the mean. So if we have a z-score of negative one, then it pertains to an x value that's one standard deviation below the mean, z-score of positive one, that is related to an x value that's one standard deviation above the mean. And then 16% of scores are above, or one standard deviation or more above the mean, and then 16% of scores are one standard deviation or more below the mean. So these predictable proportions based on the mean and standard deviation are what allow us to use this thing called the unit normal table to determine different probabilities associated with different values, even when we don't have access to the raw data. So let's go ahead and take a look at the unit normal table. The first thing that I want to point out is that there's th four different columns, A, B, C, and D. And so column A has all the Z scores, so all the locations along the X axis in the distribution. And here's the unit normal table. And this table goes on for a while. I think it goes all the way to Z scores of four. So these column A just represents the Z scores along the distribution. So if we look at this, column A just corresponds to the Z scores here. So if you look at the table, you'll see that there are no negative values whatsoever, none. And that's because this is based on a normal distribution. And in a normal distribution, it's symmetrical. This side is a mirror image of this side. So whatever values, whatever proportions in columns B, C, and D that we'll talk about in a little bit pertain to these values will pertain to these values. So as you'll see, 16% of scores are above one standard deviation or have a Z score above one, whereas 16% of scores have a Z score less than one. So these are identical proportions on either side. So it'll be up to you to know if you're working with positive or negative values, but the values that you'll find in the table won't depend on if it's positive or negative. And that'll make more sense as we do some examples as well. Just remember that the normal distribution, one side is a mirror image of the other, so there's no need to have negative values in the table because it's redundant. it would just be redundant it's going to be identical to what the proportions would be based on the positive values. So column A has the z-scores, and then columns B, C, and D have proportions associated with each z-score. And you'll see proportion in the body, body just meaning the bigger portion of the graph. See how it's pictured up here? This would be a body, proportion in the tail, just the smaller portion of the graph. 
And it doesn't have to be in this exact location, just the smaller portion, regardless of where it is. And then proportion between mean and z, that's, you know, from any given score in the distribution z-score to the middle of the distribution of the mean. And I'll show you pictures of that here, just for example. So column B, scores in the body, the larger portion. So just for example, to the left of a z-score of 1. So less than a z-score of 1. This would be a body. Greater than 1 would be a tail, the smaller portion of the graph. And you can check these values that I told you, this p equals 0.68 within one standard deviation, p equals 0.16 outside, you no know, more than one standard deviation from the mean, because those values come from that table. So let's go ahead and look at the table and see what is the proportion in the body for a z-score of 1 in the body. So let's look. So we know what the z-score is. We know it's 1. So let's scroll through here. Z-score of 1, proportion in the body, the larger portion of the graph, 0.8413. Now if we go back and look here, 0.8413. So 84.13% of all scores in this normal distribution would have a z-score that is less than or equal to 1. Well, if we look at 0.68, all this here, plus 0.16, so all of this plus all of this, you end up with 0.84. So that goes back to what we just saw in the table. Now let's look up the p-value or the proportion or probability associated with scores with a z-score greater than 1. So now we're still going to look for a z of 1 in that table, but now instead of looking in the body, the larger portion, we want to look at the tail, the smaller portion of this graph. So let's look at the table. 1 is still our z-score, proportion in the tail, 0.1587. Well, that's pretty darn close to this 0.16 that is the characteristic of a normal distribution and you can get that from that table as well. So the table just confirms the proportions that you see in this picture. Now that last column in the table, column D, that's the proportion between the mean and Z. So from negative one to zero would be an example, or from two to zero, or whatever Z score you wanna look at, just if your frame of reference is from that score to the mean of all the scores. So if we think about this characteristic here, if 68% of all scores fall within one standard deviation of the mean, be it above or below, if we split that in half, then 0.68 divided by 2 is 0.34. So based on this picture, we would say, okay, well, 0.34, probability of 0.34 or proportion of 0.34 would be from a z-score of negative 1 to 0. And we can confirm that with the table. So if we look at the table, proportion between mean and z, 0.3413. Now keep in mind, see this is just 1. It doesn't say negative 1, but that's okay because from here to here, so from positive 1 to the mean would be 0.3413 probability of selecting scores between that, those values or proportion of scores between those values. And it's identical on the other side. The proportion of scores between the mean and z of negative 1 is also 0.3413, either way you look at it. Now, if you wanted to find the proportion of scores within one standard deviation of the mean, well, then you could say, okay, what proportion is from the mean to negative one standard deviation? Well, 0.3413 from the mean to z, right here. Mean to z from 1 or negative 1 to the mean is 0.3413 then you could just double that. So you could say, okay, well, remember, mirror image, if 0.3413 or 34.13% of scores fall between negative one z-score and the mean, then the same 34.13% of scores would be from positive one to the mean. Add those together and you get really close to 0.68 within rounding. 
So now you know what column A, column B, column C, and column D are in the unit normal table. And I'm going to show you how to use the unit normal table and z-scores to find particular values of proportions or x values when you don't have access to the raw data. So this little flow chart just kind of shows you the thought process that's used. So if you are asked to find the probability of a specific range of x values, or the proportion of scores above or below a certain x value. Then you will use the formula for z to turn x into a z-score. Then you'll find the z-score in column A of the unit normal table, and that will tell you that probability or proportion that you're interested in. But you may have something that's reversed. You may be given a proportion or probability or, you know, what scores at the 80th percentile type of question. So then you start with the p-value. Then you go to the unit normal table and you look in the body, the tail, or between mean and z, depending on what type of proportion that you're looking for, to find the z-score in column A. And then you'll turn that z-score into the x-value that you're looking for using the x formula here. So let's go ahead and do a couple of examples where you are starting off with an x value and then you are finding p values or you're starting off with a score and you're trying to find the proportion of scores within a range of that score or the probabilities associated with those scores. So we're going to start with x, turn it into z, and then go to the table to find the probability or proportion. So IQ tests have a mean of 100 with a standard deviation of 15. And according to the IQ testing agency, they consider somebody to have normal intelligence if they have an IQ score between 85 and 115. So the question would be, what proportion of the population is of normal intelligence? So in other words, what proportion of the population has between an 85 and a 115 on the IQ test? So the first thing, remember, going back to our little flow chart, we have to turn this x, these x values into z-scores. Then we can go to the unit normal table. And as part of this, usually I draw a picture to help me figure things out. So I will start off with some calculations, and then I will draw a picture to show me what column do I want to look for? Do I need to look in a body, a tail, or between mean and z? So first step, let's find our z-scores. All right. So z when x equals 85. So it's x minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So 85 minus 100 divided by the standard deviation of 15. Well, 85 minus 100 is negative 15 divided by 15. We get a z-score of negative 1. Now we need to find the z-score for 115. So 115 minus 100 divided by 15 gives us 15 divided by 15. 1 is that z-score. So we've done that first step. We found the z-score. Because there's no x values in this unit normal table, only z-scores. So we have to convert x into z to then use this table to find the probability or proportion. All right. So now, I need to figure out what column am I looking for in the unit normal table. So, I'm going to go ahead and draw what I'm looking for. So, let's see. The mean is 100, so that's right there in the middle. And I'm looking for between 115 and 85. And your picture doesn't have to be perfect. Just try to make it so that the mean's in the middle. Yeah, that doesn't look very good, but it's still going to help us find what we want. All right. So the mean's in the middle. 
and we want to find everything between these two scores. So what we're really looking for are two mean to Z's or column D. So we're looking for the proportion between 115 and 100 and 85 and 100. And another way that we could write this out, so these would be our X values. Well, our Z values that we just found from negative 1 to the mean and from positive 1 to the mean. So let's go ahead and go to the table. And we already found this value, but let's go back and look again. What is the proportion between the mean and a z-score of 1? Proportion, the proportion between mean and z is 0.3413. So point three four one three plus point three four one three because remember the proportion is going to be the identical proportion between the mean and z if you have a negative one or a positive one z score so point three four one three plus point three four one three gives us point six eight two six And that would be our final answer. So the proportion of scores from 85 to 115. So you just kind of have to draw it out, figure out which proportions you're looking for. And if there's multiple ones that you're looking for, then you just add them together, just combine them. So now let's look at another problem. So candidates for the Minza Club, so this exclusive club for geniuses, must score above 133 to belong. So what proportion of test takers would make it into the club? So how exclusive is this? Is there a really small proportion of people that score that high? Let's find out. First step, again, we need to find our z-score when x equals 133. So x minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. 133 minus 100 divided by 15 gives us 33 divided by 15. And 33 divided by 15 is 2.2. That is our z-score. So let's go ahead and plot this out to figure out if we're looking at a body or a tail. I'm just going to draw my normal curve first. I'm going to put my mean in the middle again. And then 133 would be roughly here. And my z score for my mean would be 0. And I just found my z score for 133, 2.2. So again, this is x and this is z. So if I'm shading this in, I'm looking for scores that are above 133. That is clearly a tail, the smaller portion of the graph, right? Tail. So now I'm going to go to the unit normal table. I'm going to find the z-score of 2.2, then look for the proportion in the tail in column C. All right. 2.2, looking for that z-score. And these are in numeric order, makes it a little easier to find. Keep on going. Boom, 2.2, right there. Proportion in the tail, 0.0139. So, go back here. P equals 0.0139. Or, if you multiply this by 100, you could say 1.39 percent. So in other words, 1.39 percent of IQ test takers qualify for the Minza Club for Geniuses. Alright, so now let's look at the other end of the scale 
the morons, and that is the technical term. And the cutoff for being a moron is anywhere between an IQ score of 41 and 55. So what proportion of test takers would be considered a moron? All right, so let's go ahead and do that first step, finding the z-scores. So we need to find two here because we're looking at two different x values. So the z when x equals 41. So x minus the mean divided by the standard deviation, 41 minus 100 divided by 15. That gives us negative 59 divided by 15. And negative 59 divided by 15 is negative 3.933. First z score. Next z score. Z for x equals 55, the upper limit of moronhood, x minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. I always rewrite my formulas just to make sure that I get everything in there that I need. So 55 minus 100 divided by 15, and 55 minus 100 is negative 45 divided by 15, and we end up with negative 3. These are my z-scores. Let's go ahead and draw the distribution so we can easily find what we want to look for. All right, so I'm going to start off with a normal-ish curve. I always put my line in the middle to identify my mean of, in this case, 100. And now we're at the low end of the distribution. So. 41 and 55. So we're looking for scores right here. And these are our x values corresponding to z values, a negative. I'm just going to put 3.9 to negative 3 and then that z-score is zero. Remember, the z-score for the mean is always zero. Well, this isn't a body, a tail, or a mean to z. So, you can be creative in how you find, how you isolate the proportion that's right here. There's multiple ways you could do it. You could look for the proportion in the body for a z-score of 3.9 to get all of this, and then look for the proportion in the body for a z-score of 3 to get all of this, and then you would subtract all of this from all of this, which you found, to isolate this. You could also look for the proportion between the mean and a z of 3.9, and then look for the proportion between the mean and the z of 3, and you could find the difference to then isolate this. So let's go ahead and, oh, here's another one. You could look for the proportion in the tail for a z of 3 to find this, and then subtract proportion in the tail for a z of 3.9 to get rid of this, subtract that from all of this, and isolate this right here. So let's go ahead and do that method first, looking at the tails. So if I go to my unit normal table, and I find the proportion in the tail for 3 and the proportion in the tail for 3.9. So, looking for 3, that's my z-score. There is 3. So the proportion in the tail for a z-score of 3 is 0 .0013. I'll remember that. Then, for a z-score of 3.93, roughly, we don't have the exact value here, but roughly, 0 .00005. So what I'm going to do is take 0 .0013 and subtract 0 .00005. And I'll show you why I'm doing that right here. So let me just write this down. P with a Z score less than negative 3 
is equal to 0 0.0013. So that's a tail, remember? And then the p-value, probability or proportion, for a z-score less than negative 3.93 is roughly 0 0.00005. So if I do some color coding, this represents this piece right here. Whereas 0 0.0013 represents all of this. So we want to find just this. So we can take all of this, this entire proportion of scores, or 0 0.0013 of scores, and subtract this right here, and you end up with, let's see, 0 0.0013 minus 0 0.0005 equals 0 0.001. Or in other words, 0.1% of test takers would be considered a moron. So actually, it's an even more exclusive group to be a moron than it is to be a genius. So I mentioned there's three ways to do it, you know, focusing on the body, the tail, or the mean to Z. Now I want to show you how to use the mean to Z column to find the same answer, as you'll see here in a second. All right, so let's draw this out. Got my normal distribution. Plot my mean in the zero, or my mean in the middle. And we're still looking between 41 and 55. So shading this in here. Same thing as before, and just so that we can remember, here's our x values. Our z, negative 3.93 for a score of 41, and negative 3 for a score of 55. So if we wanted to focus on looking at the mean to z, so we could look for the mean to a z score of negative 3.93 and the mean to a z score of negative 3. And we can take this entire proportion of the graph, subtract this proportion, and we're left with this. So let's go ahead and go to the unit normal table and find these values. So for a z-score of 3, the proportion from mean to z is 0.4987. So for 3, 0.4987. So I'm going to use green for that, 0.4987, that is the proportion from the mean to z equals 3. And then the proportion of the graph from the mean to a z equals negative 3.93, 3.93, roughly 3.93 here, it's an estimate. 0.499995. 0 0.499995. Alright. So in red. 0.49995. That's the proportion from the mean to Z equals roughly 3.90. So if we do the math and we take 0.49995 minus 0.4987, you are left with 0 0.001. Same answer that we got before, just using different columns in the table. 0.001 or, you know, 0.1% of all test takers would be considered a moron. So now let's flip it a little bit. Now let's try to find particular x values associated with particular proportions. 
And typically, these problems will be present, presented to you as, you know, what score is at the something percentile? So this is where, where we'll start in column B, C, or D, depending on what part of the distribution we're interested in. Then we'll find the z-score in the table that corresponds to that p-value, and then use the formula for finding x to figure out what score is at a certain percentile. So, same IQ test, mean of 100, standard deviation of 15, and if you're asked what score is at the 90th percentile. So, we have to start with finding a p-value in the table, locating the z-score in the table, and then using this formula to calculate x. So my first step in this is to draw a nice pretty picture. Got my normal curve. I'm going to go ahead and plot my mean in the middle, 100, with a z-score of 0. So x and z. And I'm looking for the score in the 90th percentile. So remember, percentiles and cumulative percents mean the same thing. So if it's the 90th percentile, I'm asking what score separates the bottom 90% from the top 10%? Because if your score is at the 90th percentile, that, may, that means that your score is as high or higher than 90% of the distribution. So in other words, 90% of scores are equal to or less than this particular score that we're looking for. So if we drew that in our distribution, we would be looking for this portion of the graph right here. This would be 0.10 because the rest of the graph is that bottom 90% or 0.90. So you could find 0.90 in the body, or you could find 0.10 in the tail. No matter which route that you take, you're going to wind up with the same z-score. And the way that I did this math, 90th percentile, the score that is equal to or greater than 90% of all the scores in the distribution, well, this represents 100% of the scores, or a percent or a p-value of 1. Well, 1 minus 0.90 gives you that 0.10. Or thinking about it in terms of percents, the bottom 90% of the distribution is here. That leaves the top 10% here, 0.10. So like I said, either way you want to go about finding the z-score based on the p-value, it doesn't matter if you find 0.90 in body, 0.10 in tail, you're going to get the same z-score. So let's go ahead and look at the table. Let's go ahead and focus on the body. So I'm looking for 0.90 in the body. And these are numeric order, so I just keep scrolling up. Oh, all right. Here we go. Oh, not quite yet. Keep going up. Okay, that's more like it. So, looking in the body column, looking for 0.90. Now here, it's a toss-up between two values, between this value and this value. This one's just below 0.90, this one's just above 0.90. And as you've noticed, we don't have every single possible value in this table, or this table would be humongous, so we have to go with the best estimate. So what we want to do is we want to go for the z-score that corresponds to the probability or the proportion that's closest to the one that we're looking at. Well, in this case, this one is closer. So if you did the math and you said, okay, you know, 0.90 is what we're looking for, minus 0.8997. So that's 0 0.0003 away from what we're looking for. It's pretty darn close. Whereas this one's a little bit further away, 0 0.90 minus 0 0.9015. It's 0 0.0015 away. Whereas this one was 0 0.0003 away, it's technically closer. So we'll go with this z-score. Now if we were going the other way, let's say we were looking for 0.10 in the tail. Well, guess what? 
This is the closest to 0.10 in the tail. This one is 0 0.0003 away. This one is also 0 0.0015 away, just like this one was. So no matter which way you go for it, this one's closest to 0 0.90 in the body. This one's closest to 0 0.10 in the tail. Both tell you we're looking at a z-score of 1.28. So the z-score at the 90th percentile is 1.28. But we're not done. The question doesn't ask us what z-score is at the 90th percentile. It's what score. So anytime I ask you for a score, I'm looking for x, the raw score. So let's go ahead and use the x formula, x equals z times standard deviation plus the mean, to figure out what z or x value corresponds to a z-score of 1.28 in this distribution. So remember, I'm just going to rewrite my formula x equals z times the standard deviation plus the mean and plug in what we know. We just found z, 1.28 multiplied by the standard deviation of 15 plus 100. 1.28 times 15 is 19.2 plus 100. 119.2 is our value. So if I wanted to plug that in here 119.2 would be my x value there. And so that would be your final answer. And this makes sense, right? This value, this 119.2, is larger than the mean. It's to the right of the mean in the distribution, and it has a positive z-score. So all those things add up. It makes sense. Yeah, this is probably the right value. It doesn't. No alarm bells are going off telling me I've done something wrong. Now this one's a little bit trickier. What two scores define the middle 90% of scores in the distribution? So we're looking for two scores that separate the middle 90% of the distribution. So if we draw a picture of this, my rough sketch of a normal distribution, my means in the middle, Roughly, I always plot it that way. We're looking for the middle 90%. So most of the scores. So we're leaving, let's see. So this would represent a proportion of 0.90 scores. And remember, this entire distribution represents a proportion of 1 or 100% of the scores. If we're looking at a proportion of 0 0.90 in the middle, or 90% of the scores in the middle, that leaves 10% of the scores. You split that 10% into these two tails, and you've got right here. Oop. So 10% divided by 2 is 5%. Turn it back into a proportion, it's 0 0.05. So here we've got 0 0.05 in this tail. Point in this tail. These are all p-values. Proportions or probabilities. So what we really want to find are these two scores that represent the middle 90% of the distribution. So what we are looking for is x. But we're going to use the unit normal table to find the p-values that we're looking for, to find the z-values, and then use that x formula to figure it out. I'm just going to plot some of the things I do know. I know that the mean has a z-score of 0, and that the mean in this distribution is 100. OK, so there's multiple ways that you could go about doing this. I'm going to go ahead and opt for looking for the z-score that corresponds to p equals 0.05 in the tail. So this is a tail, tail and tail. So if I look for the z-score that's right here representing the z-score that separates 0.05 in the tail, I can know that that's the same z-score that's over here because the z-score for 0.05 in this tail is going to be the same z-score that represents 0.05, the p of 0.05 in this tail. So let's go ahead and go to my unit normal table and we're going to go to proportion in the tail and find 0.05. 
So I'm scrolling. Oh, keep on going. It's getting smaller and smaller. 0.05, where are you? Okay. Oh no! Check it out. Remember before I said that you have to look for the p value in your table, p standing for probability or proportion, that's closest to the one you're looking for. Well, both of these are exactly 0 0.0005 away from 0 0.05. So whenever that happens, always go with the larger z score. So if it's a toss up between these two, 1.64 and 1.65, because the proportion and the tails are both exactly the same distance from the one we're looking for, go with the larger value for the z-score. So 1.65 is the value that we're going to go with. Now it's not just 1.65, remember we're looking for two scores, but they're the exact same distance from the mean, or related to the exact same proportion in the tail. So we're going to have the positive and the negative version. So 1.65 and negative 1.65. So we need to find these two x values. One that represents 1.65 standard deviations below the mean, and then the other x value that represents 1.65 standard deviations above the mean. So let's go ahead and use our x formula. x equals z times standard deviation plus the mean. Let's find it for negative 1.65 first. Negative 1.65 times 15 plus 100. Well, negative 1.65 times 15 is negative 24.75 plus 100. We end up with an x value of 75.25. So that's our low end of our range. Now let's find the next one. So x equals same formula, just now we're going to have the positive version of this z-score. 1.65 times 15 plus 100 equals positive 24.75 plus 100, 124.75. <clears throat> That's the high end of the range of x values we're looking for. So if I wanted to plug this in up here, 124.75 to 75.25. So your final answer, what two scores to find the middle 90% of scores in the distribution between 75.25 and 124.75. Now, just as a side note, those are the most complicated when you're looking for values between two scores. Last example, what score is at the 15th percentile? So thinking about what is the 15th percentile, remember the percentile tells you what score is separating the bottom scores, so the bottom 15% of scores. So in other words, 15% of scores are equal to or less than some specific x value. So if we're drawing that out, and I want to see pictures at all times. These pictures help a lot when it comes to looking at the table and finding values. Even if your pictures look kind of wonky like mine. All right, normal distribution. Starting with the mean in the middle, has a z-score of zero. The bottom 15% of the distribution is basically what the 15 15th percentile is saying. So right here, with a p of 0.15. And just kind of as a side note, remember, you could look for the proportion in the body or the tail for these to find the z-score. So if we're looking here, you could look for 0.15 in the tail or you could look for 0.85 in the body. Remember, this represents 1, the entire distribution, and then 1 minus 0.15 gives you everything else, so 0.85. But I'm just going to stick with exactly what's being asked of me. So what score is at the 15th percentile? So we need to go to the table to find what z equals. 
for 0.15 in the tail. So, looking in proportion in the tail, 0 0.15. 0 0.15, 0 0.11, keep on going. Oh, okay. So, it's a toss up between these two. This one is 0 0.0008 away from 0.15. This one is 0 0.0015 away. This one's technically closer to what we're looking for. So I'm going to go with a z-score of 1.04. Now be careful. Here's another reason why drawing a picture is a really good thing to do. We're not just looking for z of 1.04. It's negative <clears throat> 1.04 because the proportion in question is to the left of the mean. So the score is going to be lower than the mean, so the z-score should be negative. So you need to keep that in mind. So z equals negative 1.04. So I'm going to draw that in up here. Negative 1.04. All right, let's figure out what x is. So x equals z times the standard deviation plus the mean. We just found that z is negative 1.04. Multiply that by 15 plus 100 equals, well, negative, point, negative 1.04 times 15 is negative 15.6 plus 100. And we end up with x equals 84.4. Final answer. I'm going to draw that in up here. 84.4. Well, this makes sense. We're looking for a score at the low end of the distribution to the left of the mean, so we know that it's a negative z-score. And conversely, we know that the score we're looking for is less than the mean, and guess what? 84.4 is less than that mean of 100. So just some final notes about using the unit normal table. As you notice, not every single value is in the table for z-scores or for proportions or probabilities. So we just use these as a pretty close estimate. Another reason that the table isn't 100% dead on accurate is that it assumes a perfect, perfectly normal distribution that has those qualities based on the mean and standard deviation of these specific proportions. Well. Sometimes we use it when we don't have a perfect normal distribution, but it's close, so that will also throw off the estimates a little bit. But again, it's the best option that we have when we don't have access to all of the raw data in a frequency distribution table where we can calculate the dead-on accurate value for probabilities or proportions. So, as I've mentioned many times before, we only really need to use the unit normal table when we don't have access to the raw data. And we're going to be using the unit normal table a lot in inferential statistics to figure out what is the probability of getting a sample mean that's this extreme or more extreme from the population. So we're going to be taking samples, manipulating some sort of condition, seeing if now their z-score is an extreme z-score relative to the rest of the distribution. And if it is, then that tells us that they probably don't fall in that distribution anymore. They're so extreme, they're so rare, it would be really, really, really highly unlikely to randomly select them from that population who didn't receive whatever was manipulated. So they probably don't represent that population anymore. They're unique now, they're different now, because whatever was manipulated in the study changed them in some way. So in other words, the independent variable had an impact on the dependent variable. So that's where we're headed. But I know that it is difficult to get used to using the unit normal table to find probabilities and to find different x values that correspond to z-scores. So make sure that you practice a lot. Practice with the odd problems in the textbook. Make sure that you come to class prepared with your practice problems and ask me questions. And we'll go over several of these examples in class. And then you'll also have the review day where we can talk about this some more.